welcome to our final part of our study on fellowship together. I'm going to be going in and digging into the last part of this section here where we are going to be where we've been talking about the fellowship of God, the fellowship of God's people with one another and with the Lord, and how we are supposed to, as the church, build one another up to be more intimate and more close together. We are to be a community of believers. And when I say the word community, that means we have to be willing to take this last part of our section here, and that is accepting. We have to accept one another. It is so easy for a family to accept one another. It is easy for folks that are part of social organizations and groups that are based upon things the members have in common whether that's politics or a uh, sense of community in the uh, involvement with others in like-mindedness, whatever the case is, or political identity, these things happen. But in the church, that's not always that easy. We often get ahead of ourselves, and we try to go and look around at everybody and try to put everybody into categories. Sometimes we do that. And that's where it can be dangerous. We shouldn't be going and looking at everybody as part of one group or one of, or part of one sect of people or one clique of people. We should look at individuals as what they are, souls that have been created by God. Each and every person that enters into a church building and assembles to be a part of fellowship needs to have the love and the encouragement of the entire body every single one of us need to be as loving as we can you know that was one of the things i learned when i was invited over to a, a fellow congregation here in the area uh, not more than a quarter mile down the road from me my wife my daughter and my son went over to this little congregation that had about 100 150 people in it and we were very different from the group that was there and that doesn't mean it was a bad thing you see, the church we were invited to was a predominantly African-American congregation. It was so good. It was such a great coming together. Everybody wanted to talk. Everybody wanted to shake hands. Everybody wanted to get to know you. Everybody wanted to talk to you because they have a sense of family in that congregation and that community needs to be so involved and part of the body of Christ and it is something that is sorely missing in all of our congregations these days it feels like we let so many things divide us we let so many problems get in the way that we forget that we are a part of a brotherhood and a family of God we need to be more accepting of one another and encourage one another we need to build these strengths that God has given us together. And we need to be more accepting in the family of God. To appreciate the challenge facing the church, we do need to consider the nature of our differences. You see, the, there are distinct differences in the church in many ways. Differences in race, as I've mentioned, you know, you have different groups. You often have people down here in the south and in the north even where they talk about a white congregation and an African-American congregation. Now, I don't want to go and say that churches are designated by race. I encourage that all congregations come together and serve together in unity with Christ. But there are differences in the approach of races. There's also differences in nationalities. Not only will you have American culture, but you could have Canadian culture, Hispanic culture, you can have Filipino culture, Korean culture. I have a friend that is up in, Illinois, uh, up in Indiana that uh, has a congregation that has three or four different assemblies. They're all one body. They're all part of the same church, but they have services that are geared toward their uh speaking their, their, their language and their nationalities so it makes it easier for them to come to know the love and not and knowledge of jesus christ now there's also differences in political ideologies where <laughs> no there's no shortage of that today everybody knows who a liberal is they know who a conservative is they know who a libertarian is but in the church, we shouldn't be worried about identity politics as far as who we serve on 
which political ticket. That's not what we're coming to church for. We're coming to serve the king, which is Jesus Christ. We are to give him praise and glory. It doesn't matter if we got an R, a D, or an I after our names. What does matter is that we are following our Savior. There's also differences in economic status, uh, whether you're poor, wealthy, or middle of the road. Uh, a lot of folks do have those designations, but we often do judge based on how much wealth a person has or how little wealth a person has. There's also differences in lifestyle, such as a person that has a simple lifestyle, very easygoing lifestyle. Somebody's a lot more extravagant and shows their money off and shows some of the things that they have, the fancier things, the finer things, whatever the case is. And then there are people that have differences in secular interests such as hobbies or sports or computing. Now, I'm in a congregation or two that uh, enjoys basketball. We've got folks that are UK fans, some that are U of L fans, and some that are Hilltoppers that are WKU fans. And I'm the odd man out. I am a Tennessee fan, and if anything the, in the last couple of years has taught Tennessee fans, it's humility. So we have to be able to show humility in all aspects, whether we are a part of a, a good basketball team or our favorite teams are cheering, or whoever we're cheering for, doesn't matter. It should not cause division or strife among us. We can give each other a hard time and love each other at the same time. We have to be willing not to put our own preferences above that of what God has established. Don't ever do that. Stay true and be focused on the interest of the kingdom. Differences in spiritual maturity. You know, there may be somebody that's weak in the faith. There may be some that are strong in the faith. There may be some that are brand new babes to Christ. They're just growing and getting into the milk. And then there are the more mature Christians that are getting into the meat and want to know more and seek out what these words mean that are in the Greek and the Hebrew. By all means, we need to be able to look at that. That's what the church does. We have all these different differences, all these differences around us, and we're using, we either use them for bad sometimes, or we can actually turn it around and use them to encourage one another. All these differences possess potential for disruption. Prejudice or bigotry is an area that can destroy the unity of a church very quickly, as well as the fellowship. Division along lines, based on our preferences or our belief systems over the God's over God's belief system or over the Word of God. Or what about even more innocent level cliques that can develop amongst people? Can that cause problems? Absolutely. If you have small groups that break off, they you know you got the rich clan over here, you got the the ha the the uh, middle class folks over here that kind of break into four or five different groups, and then you got the really uh, poor folks that are over here looking at everybody else and saying, "Why does everybody hate us?" You know, all these different groups and factions break off. We don't want to be able to see that. We want to be able to allow those differences to build our relationship with one another. Now, the key to this concept is real simple. We need to understand God's attitude toward acceptance. God has a very, very determined attitude when it comes to acceptance. God is not one to show partiality. He doesn't go and say one's big, one's short, one's fat, one's skinny. He doesn't do that. He sees us all as what we are, souls, individual souls that he has created, that he has loved, that he has nurtured, that he has cared for. And we are in this world to be able to come before him and recognize him, recognize him as our creator. He reveals himself to Israel as one who shows no partiality. If you want to, you can flip in your Bibles to Deuteronomy 10:17. The verse says here, For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God, who is not partial and takes no bribe. You see, Paul talks about him as well in Romans 2, 9 through 11 as being an impartial judge. 
Look at what the scripture says here. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek, for God shows no partiality. God is not going to go and show partiality because you're a part of some group or another nationality. Peter also writes of God's impartiality when he says in 1 Peter 1.17, And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourself with fear throughout the time of your exile. See, God's willing to accept not just a select few. He is willing to accept everybody. Every single soul is acceptable to God. There is not one, not one soul that could be diminished by Christ. Not one. You know, every now and again we talk about people in scripture such as uh, Judas. You know, I, I don't think there is a person alive that likes Judas. Uh, you know, well, it's easy not to like him because of what he did to Jesus. I mean, he went and he turned his back on him, came back with a group of soldiers and kissed him on the cheek, say, yep, this is the man. And they ended up carting him off. And we look at Judas as the ultimate betrayer, as this disgusting individual. Might, you know, we might compare him to Hitler. We might compare him to a lot of the serial killers we look at today, like a Jeffrey Dahmer or Manuel Noriega back in the days, if you remember in Panama, you know, you remember uh, back in the days when uh, the Marines were sent down to Panama to arrest uh, the drug cartel leader that was Manuel Noriega. Uh, there's all these different people that we just think that are so unsalvageable so impossible their soul can't be able to be forgiven and judas is one of them and when we go and we look at scripture we also realize something else peter was just like judas you see jesus had predicted that judas was going to betray him but he also predicted who else would betray him peter peter denied jesus three times three times and on that third time, he heard the rooster crow. And when he heard that, he knew that he had fulfilled the very thing Jesus said he would do. And he went off crying and repenting of his sin. You see, that is what it takes for us to be able to realize we're not unsalvageable. Judas could have very easily have done that. But instead, he gave in to his bitterness. He gave in to his fear. He gave in to all the stresses and all the demons that the, devil, that the devil could throw at him there. And he gave himself up over to that and killed himself. Now, you may have heard me mention just a minute ago folks like Jeffrey Dahmer and Emmanuel Noriega. Did you know that they, those men, have believed, repented, confessed and been baptized for the forgiveness of sins Jeffrey Dahmer did it when a Church of Christ minister came to him on several sessions and started talking to him about developing a relationship not with people but with God Jeffrey thought he was unsalvageable didn't think he could be saved but yet God's word says even Jeffrey Dahmer could be saved and Manuel Noriega now there are a lot of guys that were in the military that didn't like Manuel Noriega too much. When they bought him up to Oklahoma to be imprisoned, a group of people from an outreach ministry in Joplin, Missouri, went over to visit with him and to talk with him. Manuel listened to them, understanding that the scriptures were not just about other people, they were about him. And Manuel later did something unbelievable. He not only was going and repenting of his sin and turning his life over to God and being baptized right there in jail, but yes, he wanted to go further with that. He started teaching the Word of God in the prisons 
to everybody who would listen. And many people come to know the truth of salvation from a former drug lord. It's unbelievable, isn't it? But it's true. That's how God works. God doesn't want anyone to go and perish. Look at what the scripture says here. Even Christ has, you know, even when we go and we look at how Christ has received us and look at how Peter was shown these visions. Let's take a look at Peter and think a minute. You know, we, we've talked about Peter here and talked about how he had denied Christ. I want you to think back just a little bit here in, the, in, in Acts chapter 10. I've often talked about, and we'll do a Bible study on that soon enough. We'll be doing Acts chapter 10. I want to talk, and I'll be talking in some detail about old Peter and how his vision led him to a very important realization and led others to see that there was something more to what God had in store with Jesus Christ than any of them could possibly imagine. You see, this was the purpose for Peter's vision, was that God was willing to accept all. You see, Peter's vision was real simple. This sheet came out of heaven, this great big sheet uh, filled with animals. And that, that sheet came down, and all these different animals were on there. Well, what ended up happening there was amazing. God said, take and eat. And so what did he do? Did he take and eat? Well, no. He didn't. He said, Lord, I can't touch that. Those animals have got cloven hooves. They're dirty. God said very plainly, Don't call anything unclean that I have made. And so Peter was thinking back on that when he was going and was called before a Gentile who had gone and admitted that he needed God in his life and he wanted to know how to be saved. And in Acts chapter 10, 34 to 35, it reads, So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. And just like that, Peter realizes that this is not just about the Jewish people. It is also about the Gentiles. Peter would later recount this at the Jerusalem conference as God makes no distinction between any different groups. He goes and he says straight out, after, the, after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. The very same way Peter sought to continue to build that relationship between Jews and Gentiles. There was no distinction. There was no division. It was all in unison. And in 2 Peter 3, 9, Peter wrote that the Lord desires that all, everyone, should come to repentance. When he says here, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Repentance. We've talked a lot about repentance in the past, and I can't tell you enough how much importance it is in our lives today. And even Peter repented, not just about Jesus, but he also repented of his idea and thought that, yes, there was division between Jew and Gentile. He sought to be able to correct that issue. And that was what he wanted to be able to do, to show that God wants us to be one body, one group, and not just that, but to accept one another. Even as Christ receives us, so we are to receive one another. In Romans 15, 7, it reads, Therefore welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. You see, it is essential for us to love others just as Christ has loved us. 
In fact, Paul goes as far in Galatians to say we need to be unified and realize there is no distinction between us. We're not any different. We are each and, each and every one of us a soul that God loves. For as many of you were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male, no female, and for you are all one in Christ Jesus. There is no distinction. There is no division. It's all in unison because Christ has unified us. And that is what we are to be doing. When we understand that God is not a respecter of person and that we are to receive one another just as he does, we are better prepared to have an accepting family of God. There are a few things along that line, though, and I think that we need to apply this concept of acceptance in there. I don't believe we need to be practicing partiality in our congregations. There is a danger when we go and start practicing this idea of partisanness, whether it is a partisan because of political ideas or whether it is a partiality toward one having wealth and one not having wealth. It is so bad, and it's not what the world needs. We need to be unified no matter what class group we're a part of, no matter what part political party we're a part of, no matter what we're doing, we need to be living for Jesus every single day. We need to be working for Jesus every single day. We need to be loving like Jesus every single day. And yes, we need to remember, just as James said about showing favoritism, my brother, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. He was very much trying to tell us we need to be aware. We need to watch out because when we start setting up those distinctions, we start showing the partiality, we're going to do things wrong. I remember one time a friend of mine was going and having a church service and he decided he was going to show these folks that were in the congregation their true colors. He had served with them for several years and had seen a lot of division. And one of the biggest divisions was between people that had money and people that didn't have money. He invited a very wealthy part of the community. A gentleman that had some money and some pool in the community, politically, uh, spiritually, all these different things, had a lot of things going for him. He came into the church, and he did. He came in there, and everybody, I know you, yeah, come on over here, sit with me, sit with me. Yeah, I got the right, I wiggled it right here where we can see the preacher and hear everything and talk and do all this, and they were right on him to fellowship. Not more than a couple minutes after he had been coming, he come in and was being greeted. Another person came in. This one was a very disheveled-looking guy. He was rough. He had old clothes on. He had scra a scraggly beard and, and and was dirty, and 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 had an old hat on, and and old tennis shoes, and didn't look much. Had an old overcoat on. And when he sat down, this was before social distancing was cool. So everybody sat not just six feet away, but 12 feet away. They just would not sit next to him. They wouldn't approach him. They wouldn't talk to him. They wouldn't say nothing to him. Well, when the preacher got up, he said, Today we're going to be allowing our associate minister here to preach for us today. And I want to invite him up now to speak. And up stood the man that was all disheveled, all dirty, with all the nasty clothes on and all the dirt on his face, wet, stinky tennis shoes walking up on the stage. He read this verse to them and sat back down. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. And he continued on. 
in verses 2 through 9 of James. It says, For if a man wears a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also come in, and if you pay attention to the one who is wearing fine clothes and say, You sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, You stand over there or sit at my feet. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers. Has not God chosen those who are poor in this world to be rich in faith and heirs to the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who can drag you to court? Are you not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. He didn't have to say anything else. The scriptures already had called them out. We can go and make distinctions so much that we can't even recognize the people that we have known for several years. And we let our biases get the best of us. We try to avoid the situation rather than addressing it. You know, one of the things that really got me about this verse, then when I was reading it and studying it and thinking back to some of the lessons that we've gone over uh, together with other congregations and some of the folks that I know, one of the things was you got to love yourself. Love others as you love yourself. I think we have forgotten how to love ourselves sometimes. We have such low self-esteem. A lot of folks are depressed in these days. And what ends up happening is that there's a lot of division because, honestly, we're selfish. Or we're not self enough. We're not self-aware enough. We don't love ourselves enough. You've got to understand that, yes, you're worth being saved. You are worth being saved. Don't ever think you're not. Because God has given himself over to you. He's given himself over to death for you. He loved you enough to do that. No, we're not worthy of it. None of us are. But the great gift is this. He has deemed us worthy for it. His word says that. Just as Peter said that none should perish, but all come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And that means that we have to be willing to put on the new man through spiritual renewal. Whatever our differences, we are to all become like Christ. Read Colossians 3 with me here. Colossians 3, 9 through 15. Let's see what this says together here. Do not lie to one another. See that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here is, there is not Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave-free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. It's interesting that love is mentioned as the virtue there. Above all, put on love. Don't act like you love somebody. Don't just go and say, hey, I love you, and then ignore them all the rest of the time. 
You do that to God, and he's going to remember it. You need to get to know God and get intimate with him, but you also need to get intimate with God's people. You need to love God's people the same way you love God. If you claim to love God and you can't love people, there's a real problem there. Because the honest truth is you don't love God. It is essential for us to love both and to be able to encourage both. That means we have to take a proper approach. We need to come before God and we need to come before others and we need to have hearts of compassion, not ice. We need to be kind, not cruel. We need to be humble, not proud. We need to be gentle, not harsh. We need to be patient, not intolerant. We need to be forgiving, not judgmental. And we need to be loving, not bigoted. That is essential for every single Christian person. We are to be Christ in this world. And not only to the church, but to people that are lost as well. Now, I can hear people already. Does that mean we've got to accept people in just because they're drunk, because they've got drug addictions, and they're, in, and they're not repenting of it, they're not going to do anything like that? Or what about somebody that is living a homosexual lifestyle? Do we go and just accept them in on a handshake and say they don't need to change? Let me be blunt here. The first thing we have to recognize are these are people. Okay? These are people. doesn't matter where they've been. What matters is where they're going. And we have to be key to helping them to be able to overcome. Acceptance based on who they are as a soul, a human being, that God has created does not mean we go and accept sin. But what it does mean is we accept them. We are to be accountable for one another. And if somebody chooses to be a part of the fellowship, by all means, we need to help them be able to be accountable and be able to take stock in and realize that some things God is not going to agree with, that the scripture is going to condemn, and that we need to help them be able to see the truth. How can we do that if we're shunning people because they are living in the world of sin? I know hundreds and hundreds of people who are not only living in sin, but are engaged actively in coming in church because they have decided that they would rather live together than be married. Does that mean they are any more different than somebody who is living in a house with another woman or another man and in a relationship with them? It's the same level. And we have to be able to pull the people in together and we need to help them to see that sin is sin. But we can't do that when we're all pointing fingers and saying your sin is bigger than mine. Everybody's sin is equal in God's eyes just as everyone's soul is equal in God's eyes. Thus, we need to help one another more than ever because we are called to love each and every single person no matter where they are at in their journey. That means if they're sinning, we help them to not sin. We help them to overcome the aggravation and the torment of this life. To try to encourage themselves by doing something that the world says is okay. And start realizing that God loves them for who they are and what they can be. And I know so many that can do so great. But we've got to be willing to love others first. Though differences lose their significance, doesn't mean differences cease to exist. It means that we need to be focusing in on what's important. You know, men and women are going to have different roles in the church. Uh, Believers and non-believers are going to act differently in the church. We need to be able to encourage the non-believers. Well, how are we going to do that when the believers act like non-believers sometimes? We need to be able to make the distinctions to be fellow soldiers in this life and work together and build together and help people overcome the adversity of sin by being a community of God first. 
that people see our place as a safe space. I'm not talking about one of these places that accepts everybody because uh, uh, because it's a uh, political expedient idea. I'm saying maybe we need to love Jesus and love people and be willing to help those people who need help who are looking to go and find a place where they can be loved, encouraged, and strengthened by God's Word and by God's people. It doesn't mean we've got to be hateful. It just means we've got to love Jesus more and help them to love Jesus more. As we grow in Christ, putting on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. We are more likely to fulfill the admonition of Paul when he says in Romans 15, 7, Therefore receive one another, just as Christ also received us, to the glory of God. Only as we accept one another without partiality, without any kind of motive. We accept each other rich, poor, black or white, Jew or Gentile, wherever we may be in our walk, however much study we've done, if we are never opened the Bible in our lives or we're a, a, a third year graduate student in the Bible school, Whatever the case is, we are to encourage and love one another. And we are to build the family of God. And not just build it, be it. Are you contributing to that family? Are you contributing to the accepting family of God? Are you willing to accept others, even as God has accepted you? Or maybe you haven't accepted God yet. Maybe you hadn't heard the message of Jesus. Maybe you have now and you've realized, you know, I want to be a part of a family like that. I want to accept Jesus as he has accepted me. Believe in him. Repent of your sin. Confess Jesus Christ as the son of the living God. Be baptized for the forgiveness of sin. And walk in the newness of life or maybe something that was said today wants you to go and get right maybe you have lived a life where you've judged others maybe you've gotten into a life where you have discriminated because of somebody's look or because somebody's wealth or because somebody had something you didn't have whatever the case is there shouldn't be division because of those things in church be willing to accept one another and love one another. Turn that away. Turn that back and give it back to Jesus. Go and rededicate yourself to walking with him. Maybe you want to challenge yourself. Maybe you've got a challenge you want to do. Maybe you see something that needs to be done in your church and you want to challenge them to accept Jesus just as we are talking about here. Be willing to take that challenge up. And if you need to talk, all you've got to do is write me. Feel free to message me on Facebook at facebook.com slash brother Robbie. I'll be glad to listen. And I'll be glad to pray with you too in whatever decision you make. And I'll help you find a home congregation if you need it. I'll help you find a group of believers that love you and love the Lord. We'll work together to make this world a better place. Not for the world itself, but for the kingdom of God. Because the kingdom of God is not something that is going to go away anytime soon. The kingdom of God is eternal, just as his word is. Interested in apologetics and examining why God's word is historically accurate and true? Get your free copy of our ebook, Arrogant or Accurate, at www.myllbia.com today.